Hello, it's Scott Manley here. In the last 48 hours, we have been hit with the tragic news that the Arecibo radio telescope is very likely going to be demolished for safety reasons. And, you know, this is this is hard. The Arecibo telescope is, uh, it's, it's iconic, it's superlative, it is world-renowned, it is one of the most recognisable instruments used by astronomers. It is a radio telescope built into a natural sinkhole in the ground. Uh, above that, they sit the instrument platform, which is suspended over this uh, dish by three towers with cables attached. So back in August, you may remember that one of the cables had become detached from the towers. It was a cable that sat, was like laid into a socket and it just pulled out of this socket. Normally these sockets are uh, held together by liquid, they pour in liquid like zinc and that apparently has pulled out and then that swang in and hit and damaged the dish. But of course, that was seen initially as a worrying but temporary setback. They had a bunch of engineers start looking at the problem, figuring out how to fix it, and uh, they were performing, they were offering their um, you know, plans. They actually had cable that was in the process of being shipped out there that they were going to use to temporarily relieve the strain. And then on November 5th, one of the remaining cables on that same tower snapped. It didn't pull out of its socket this time, it actually snapped under the strain. So these cables, the they have a 500 ton braking force. They're like three inches, seven and a half centimeters thick. They are pretty darn big and they have, they're very heavy. Um, now, there's actually two types of cables involved because the telescope was upgraded in 1997. Initially, when the telescope was built, its central uh, instrument platform had a mass of about 550 tons, and it was supported by three cables on each tower. Each cable was three inches in, in diameter, about seven and a half centimeters, and had roughly a 500 ton braking force. Now, they, when they upgraded the telescope in 1997, they added the Gregorian Dome system, which was a series of mirrors or you know, radio reflectors that would focus the signal better and produce you know, better quality uh, results. So for that, that would actually raise the mass of the centre to about 800, over 800 tonnes. But in addition to that, they also added vertical cables, which would pull the platform down to keep it at the exact focal point. And this meant that they were also adding like 100 odd tons of force that would vary depending upon the time of day. So anyway, to compensate for this, they added two extra cables to each tower. And these were slightly thicker. They were three and a quarter inches, about eight and a half centimeters. Uh, and these would have a braking force of about 600 tons. So anyway, the, sec the first break or the first cable that pulled out was an auxiliary cable that was added in 1997. The cable that just broke recently was an original cable from the 1960s. And the very worrying thing about this is it broke at about 60% of its expected braking strength. That, that is very concerning because it means that the models they have, this, the, you know, that they've been working from, has been overestimating the remaining strength in these cables. So they've removed two cables out of six on one tower. That means the other four cables are now having 50% more force. It's it just, it totally, it's not without, um, it's not entirely unlikely that one of these cables could give way and then the other ones could just snap, 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 right? This could be a cascading failure that we are watching have, playing out over time. And so the plans that had been made to fix this are now looking very, very, very dangerous. So to, to do this, they would have to put people on the platform in the middle, they would have to be stringing cable and working on it, and they would have to be adjusting the load while they are on the platform. And that is not a good situation to be in because changing the loads causes the tensions to change on these cables. And, and they've observed apparently a few new breakages in other cables. So they're in a situation where they're seeing this situation potentially getting worse rather than better. And that means they've taken the decision that they're not going to put people on this platform to try and fix it. They actually, if you look at some of the online um, 
data. They, they looked at having people working on this platform while secured by cables from a helicopter hovering overhead so that if something catastrophic happened, they would remain hanging there while the platform fell away underneath them. Like, that was the kind of thing they were looking at. It's, um, yeah, it's, it's, I, I like, I don't know. I mean, there, there may be ways to save it. So originally, when this was built, they constructed the towers first and then they constructed the wires. But they didn't put the um, the gantry, the central truss structure up. They built that on the ground, strung it all together, and then winched that up and attached it to those cables. And then they started building the dish underneath. Now, at this point, if they want to take it down carefully, they have to get rid of large parts of this dish in the middle. They would probably have to build some sort of scaffolding, or they'd have to run extra load over cables. I, like... I'm not an engineer. I really am not a structural engineer. I'm, I'm not even an aerospace engineer. And I, you know, I, I, <laughs> I talk about that all the time, but I am very much aware of what I don't know here. And I'd love to know the opinions of anybody that actually works with these kind of cabling. But as it stands, yeah, this is absolutely tragic. It, our SIBO is a unique instrument. And again, if you watch my other video, I go into some of the history, some of the great discoveries that have been made. This is I think it's the only place that's been able to do like radar imaging of Saturn, which is quite astounding. It has, it was the first telescope to get evidence to support gravitational waves by looking at binary pulsars. It of course collected the pulse shape structures that became the cover of Joy Division's famous album, which became itself a cultural icon. But as a science instrument, it was kind of interesting, kind of niche. It had a great sensitivity, it, but it could only cover a limited section of the world. It had much shorter integration times. So yeah, losing Arecibo is a massive loss. I mean, it is a unique instrument. So in, it's obviously one of the largest radio telescopes in the world. It has recently been eclipsed by the Chinese FAST telescope, which is a 500 meter aperture. Arecibo is more like 305 meters. But FAST does not do radar astronomy. And there's a difference here. Radio astronomy is where you're pointing your dish at a target and you're just watching its natural emissions come down and trying to infer stuff from it. Radar astronomy is where you are generating a radio signal, sending it to the target and then watching the echoes come back. And this has been very useful. It you know, was the, used to figure out the rotation of Mercury, the rotation of Venus. Uh, but most importantly, it is incredibly useful for figuring out the orbits of near-Earth asteroids. When we discover asteroids, we find them on images. You see little dots and you can figure out its coordinates on the sky, the right ascension and declination. And you can watch that over time. So you have very accurate pointing but you don't know how far away the asteroid is. So you sort of try to fit an orbit to that, but there's still a lot of uncertainty in that distance. With a radar, if, you, if it comes close enough, you can hit it with a radar pulse, read that back, and you get the exact distance down to really high precision, and you also get the exact radial velocity. So when a near-Earth asteroid flies by the Earth, Radar lets us get a lot more information about it and also gets us the level of orbital accuracy that lets us predict the orbit decades in advance. And near-Earth asteroids are the ones that can come close and potentially hit the Earth. So you want to know those orbits as accurately as possible. And Arecibo was by far the best instrument to do it. I believe it was able to generate a radio, uh, continuous wave radio signal of like one megawatt. The next best installation in the world is at Goldstone, which is part of the Deep Space Network, actually. It's operated by JPL. So their biggest telescope or radar system uh, can generate like a 500 kilowatt beam. I, I, I may be getting this wrong. It might be like a beam power, but it's like half the power and it has one tenth the collecting area of Arecibo. That means it's 20 times less effective. Now, you might think, oh wow, that means that Arecibo can get 20 times more objects. It doesn't quite work like that because you've probably heard of the inverse square law where um, the amount of energy emitted by a star or a spherical source goes down by the distance 
or it goes by the inverse of the distance squared, right? With radar, you have that in both directions, right? So you should send the beam out and whatever distance it's at, you have an inverse square law, right? But then the pulse gets reflected back and you have the same inverse square law. So radar range actually goes as the inverse r to the power four. That means if you double the distance, then your signal drops by a factor of 16. So although Arecibo is about 20 times better than the next best telescope, it only gets a little more than twice the range. But having said that, that still means that it, of asteroids that are flying by the Earth now, we've gone from, we've reduced the number that we can observe by a factor of four, right? Goldstone will still be able to get near-Earth asteroids, but just not as many as Arecibo could. Although, I guess Arecibo had uh, issues with not being able to point in certain directions, so that, it's maybe not a quarter, but you get the idea. This is a massive step down in the capabilities. And radar could also give us these beautiful images showing the geometry of the object, that you couldn't get from ground telescopes, resolving levels of detail that just aren't possible because radio, you can scale up the size of your dish beyond what you could with an optical telescope and you can illuminate things which would normally not be illuminated by solar light. So yeah, uh, very likely this dem demolition is gonna happen. And I suspect that if they, they can't figure out how to save it, they're probably just going to just snap all those cables using some sort of demolition process. Uh, that seems to be the safest way to do it. If you try to support it somehow, then you're putting people in a situation where, um, you know, they, they would might as well be trying to save it. So I, I suspect that it's going to be like a big bang and this thing will fall into the dish, just like the end of Goldeneye or you know, that uh, level in Battlefield or Modern War, I don't know, whatever. Call of Modern Duty Warfare, right? Anyway, uh, yeah. I mean, it's this is, the thing, to, the thing about this is that Arecibo started running into funding troubles about 15 years ago. The National Science Foundation found that its budget was basically not growing the way that it needed. Uh, in fact, it was I think it was getting cut at that time. And so they were starting to look at instruments that they could um, essentially fob off, pass on, sunset. And Arecibo was one of those. It didn't have the same support. It had a great deal of international support, oddly, but not as much domestic support. And yeah, so they tried to shut that down. They cut a chunk out of the budget, which presumably means the maintenance wasn't happening so fast. And then a few years ago, they finally found somebody that wanted to take the telescope off their hands at the University of Central Florida, I think. Um, they, uh, they were gonna take it, and uh, eventually over the next few years, they were gonna assume complete control over it. Obviously that has changed now that the telescope is in a situation that makes it totally unsafe. Like. The problem with waiting for this kind of failure to happen is now it's in a situation where the saving it is incredibly dangerous. The time to actually try and upgrade those cables and repair those cables was 10 years ago, right? Before this happened, that was the time to be doing it, but they were still cutting budgets and trying to figure out how they were going to, you know, send it all. They tried, apparently, they tried to get NASA to take this on as, as one of their instruments. And NASA's response was, well, you don't see National Science Foundation funding any of our satellites, so why should we fund, the you know, NSF's telescopes? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I just... This, this is one of these things that really gets to the heart of me. This, uh, this is something I remember seeing it as a child and I was like, wow, they built that. That is the coolest thing ever. And it was the coolest thing ever. It was just sitting out there. It turned up in all these movies. It was iconic. It sent, of course, the SETI message, which, okay, I mean, <laughs> I'm not sure that was, you can't say that was a necessarily good idea, but it was the best instrument to send it. And now it's going to very likely turn into a mass of wreckage in a big hole. You know, Arecibo isn't just that instrument. There's some other gear there. There's like a LIDAR facility for studying the atmosphere. 
I don't think that's going to have quite the same worldwide draw as this dish which could be seen from space with the naked eye. So I don't know, maybe I'm still hoping that maybe there's some solution that can present itself. It, failing that, I really hope that there is a real push to get a replacement up and running in some form or another. Something that can do radar. As I said, the Chinese system is bigger, sure, but it can't do radar. And I don't believe it can be even retrofitted to do radar, but uh, I, I could be wrong on that. Yeah, I... I uh, yeah, I, I don't even know how to end this video. It feels like as soon, if, as soon as I end this video, I'm sealing its fate. I think I'm perhaps most saddened by the fact that I never got to visit. You know, I obviously I have two jobs and I'm continually pushing out plans to do things because it clashes with one or the other. And with something like that, it was so huge, so amazing. You felt that it had always been there in the world as long as I've lived. And so I felt that it would always be there. And now it's very likely going to turn into a massive wreckage in a hole. And I'm going to be very sad when that happens. But, you know, at the same time, it has been an amazing instrument. And we do have a fantastic amount of science. It has enriched the world in so many ways. And hopefully we'll get a replacement or maybe by some miracle, someone will figure out a way to keep it alive. Hey, you know... If people got together to fund the restoration of Notre Dame Cathedral, can't we have some rich people get together and fund the repair of this amazing monument to science? That would be one of the best endings. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.